An alien spaceship has arrived at the South Pole, but the scientists investigating the arrival are about to learn that an organism that can devastate the entire planet has come with it. On a beautiful starry night in New Mexico in 1947, a radio operator named Osler receives a strange signal and decides to investigate. His dog Rex starts angrily barking upon hearing the frequencies. Osler calls up his friend Wally and learns that he's picking up the signal as well. Wally figures out that the frequencies are coming from Roswell, New Mexico, and Osler decides to check it out. He drives to Roswell with Rex and arrives at the source of the signal. As he looks out into the empty field, Rex escapes the truck and begins running. Osler follows him and finds a ditch. As he looks into it, he is shocked at what he sees. Suddenly, he hears something above him, and he looks up to see an incredibly bright, blinding light. Next, in 2003, researchers at the Axon Resources Study Corps receive the same signal from Antarctica. They transfer it to the United States, where a satellite image of an unknown object sitting in the Antarctic ice shelf is observed. They decide to dig it up, as the signal is clearly coming from the object. Meanwhile, at the University of California, Berkeley, cryptologist Julian Rome is teaching his class about languages. While he teaches, a hot young student from his class emails him to flirt with him. After class, Julian is called by John Bachman, a respected professor. He thinks he's in trouble for flirting with the student, but soon learns that Bachman doesn't want to know about that. He tells Julian about Alexei Girak, an important part of the Stanford genetics program. Bachman reveals that Alexei has reached out to him about the events in the Antarctic. He mentions that the object found in the ice shelf is emitting strange, unknown frequencies and hands Julian a disc to observe them. Julian investigates the frequencies and discovers that the frequencies are non-random, meaning there is a chance something or someone is trying to communicate with them. He shares his findings with Bachman and tells him that this may be a tracking signal. Julian asks Bachman to let him go to observe the object. Bachman is concerned because Julian used to work for SETI, which is a department that doesn't command respect in the scientific community, but he still permits Julian. Julian heads off to the South Pole, experiencing extreme tribulation in the snowy sky of Antarctica. As they land, Julian heads into the research facility and meets a researcher named Nyla Wurtzen, who greets him in a very friendly Nyla is the graduate assistant of Dr. Michael Straub, one of the head researchers at this facility. Julian meets Alexei, who takes him to see the object. As they observe the large ice block, Julian asks Alexei what he thinks is inside it. Alexei thinks it's a shale slag, caught in a glacier, but Julian knows that that's not a possibility. Alexei wildly theorizes that an extraterrestrial might have sent the item to Earth, and Julian agrees with this theory a lot more. However, he avoids any conversation about his past work with SETI because he knows it would reduce his credibility. Julian asks what NASA thinks, and Alexei simply says that their other work at this facility is at a sensitive stage, and NASA can get paranoid, so he hasn't told them yet. When Alexei leaves, Julian touches the ice block, only to have his entire life flash before his eyes. He steps back in shock. A researcher named Kate Brecker approaches him, and as the two speak, it is clear that they have a rough history between them. She leads him to his room and warns him not to make any moves on the female researchers. It appears that Julian has a reputation for being a bit of a playboy. At night, Julian begins experiencing nightmares and wakes up to Nyla at his door, asking if he wants breakfast. Next, she takes him to the greenhouse, where she shows him their plants, which are all genetically engineered for the specific purpose of growth on another world. She undresses into a bathing suit, because the pollen tends to get stuck on their clothes, and goes to work in the fields, as Julian watches her. Kate speaks to Julian, and the two seem to warm up to each other. Meanwhile, the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense talk about Julian. It turns out that Julian attempted to get his doctorate in applied linguistics from Stanford, but he got in trouble for being involved with a female student. That student was Kate, and he was unable to complete his doctorate after the scandal. He ended up working for SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Program, as a decoding cryptologist. However, as NASA ceased their funding, he began working at Berkeley where he continues working to date. 
They are interested in him because he is the only person in the South Pole right now who may understand the gravity of what is happening. The secretary hands the president a classified file named The Osler Incident. Julian joins the entire team in the dining room for a meal. He meets the rest of the crew, including Dr. Straub, Abel, the maintenance officer, Shelley Klein, and Daisha Petrov. Shelley asks what Julian does, but before he can answer, Straub makes a sarcastic remark about how Julian spends his time listening for messages from E.T. Everyone laughs, but Julian feels uncomfortable. He explains what he does, and Straub asks if he's ever interpreted any actual alien communications. Julian says he hasn't, and Shelley asks if he still believes in aliens, even though he's never heard from them. He asks her if she believes in God, and she replies that she does, and he then asks if she's ever heard from him. The room goes quiet. Julian spends hours trying to decipher the frequencies and figure out if there is a message in them, but to no avail. His co-worker, Grisham, comments that it might be a beacon of some sort. The president and his assistant learn that the radio frequencies that Osler recorded in 1947 are identical to the frequencies that Julian is currently interpreting. The president asks to see Bachman because Julian needs to hear this news from someone he trusts. In the night, Abel wakes the crew up, as the ice block has fallen and broken, revealing the object inside. As Kate tries to touch it, she's thrown back by an electrical field that seems to be surrounding the ship. Julian decodes a part of the message, while Straub insists to anyone who will listen that the object isn't an extraterrestrial one, and they are wasting their time. Julian is certain that the object is not from Earth, and most of the researchers side with him, while Straub pouts. The group decides to open the ship up, which Julian is against, however, Straub angrily orders it to be done, because it's the only way they'll put this nonsense behind them. Meanwhile, the president lets Bachman know of the top-secret events of 1947, and says that once there is an opening in the storm over the South Pole, he will have to talk to Julian through radio. While Julian continues to try and decode the message in the frequencies, the remaining crew starts cutting open the ship. Nyla mentions to Julian that she used to play Mind Maze, a computer game where each key unlocks a different door as you solve the math puzzles. Julian realizes that the intervals in the code might be the key to each letter in the message. He manages to decode the message, which says, Do not open, leaving him and Nyla shocked. They rush to stop the others, but arrive just in time to see a crew member melting after cutting open the lid. Julian tries to warn them, but an explosion knocks everyone off their feet. One crew member vaporizes into thin air. Once the crew members compose themselves, they head down to check the damage. They observe the ship, finding organic matter in it. As they watch, the matter suddenly vaporizes, revealing an alien being inside. Nyla tells Julian she doesn't feel so well, and suddenly she begins melting from inside. The crew realizes that opening the ship has caused some extraterrestrial pathogen to become airborne. Three other people melt just like Nyla, and they all step back. Meanwhile, the president contacts the Russians, planning to attack the South Pole facility with a tactical nuke to prevent the pathogen from spreading, which they already know about because the same thing happened when Osler discovered the ship in 1947. Next, the group discusses what to do while watching the alien on a camera. Straub says that they have to leave, but Julian argues that they all could be carrying the pathogen, and by leaving, they could start a pandemic that wipes out humanity. Strout says that they are obviously not sick because the others died immediately. But the other researchers point out that they could simply have a genetic resistance, slowing the pathogen's effect. This doesn't mean they aren't carriers. During this heated argument, they fail to notice that the alien has escaped. Julian asks them to grab the firearms at the facility. They all divide into groups to find the alien and to turn off any extra power so they can survive at this facility for as long as needed. As they wander the facility, the alien observes them. Julian ends up finding the alien and reassures it that he's not going to hurt it. The alien seems threatened by his flashlight, so he places it on the ground. The alien stands in front of Julian and places its claws on Julian's head. The two connect and Julian begins to see the alien's memories. Suddenly, a crew member finds them, and on Straub's insistence, shoots the alien. Julian tries to stop him, but to no avail. The crew member says he only shot the alien because he thought it would kill Julian, 
But Julian explains that the alien felt safe and friendly until he opened fire. Next, Straub insists that he wants to leave. Julian is against this because they need to be sure whether or not they're carrying the pathogen. Straub gets angry, but Alexi agrees with Julian. Grisham hears radio contact being made and connects. Bachman speaks to Julian, and Julian asks if he's contacting him regarding the alien. Bachman asks about the number of people that have been killed, and Julian admits that two were killed by accident, while four were killed by infection. He mentions that the seven remaining crew members seem to have a resistance to the virus. Bachman asks him if the area outside the center has been compromised, and he replies no one has been outside. Bachman explains that the ship they found was an escape pod, and a similar ship landed on Earth in 1947. Osler had stumbled upon it, but was never found again. He explains that the aliens are immune to the pathogen they carry, but humans are not. However, on the night the pod landed on Earth in 1947, the aliens made it clear that they wanted to form a friendship with the humans. Bachman asks Julian if the alien is alive, but he replies that it has been killed. An executive decides that the only way to deal with this situation is sterilization through nukes. Bachman is told to lie to the group, reassuring them that help is on the way. He refuses to do so. He mentions that a Russian submarine is coming, and Julian instantly realizes that they're not coming to save them. He asks Bachman how much time they have, only to be told that they have three hours. After hearing that they will die, Straub begins to panic, insisting that they don't have to stay here. He says that since they haven't died yet, maybe they have a resistance to the infection. Julian tells him that just because he hasn't died doesn't mean he's not a carrier. Shelley offers to run blood tests on everyone to see if they have the infection. Julian asks her to do that immediately. The Russians prepare their missiles to strike the research facility. The blood tests show healthy cells for everyone, but Shelley mentions that the pathogen could be hidden in the proteins. Increasingly agitated, Straub asks if anyone agrees with him. One crew member agrees, and Straub asks Kate to agree with him as well. When she disagrees, Straub swears at her, causing Julian to punch him. Grisham takes the gun from the crew member agreeing with Straub, and Julian decides to recode the keypad to the main entry port and maintenance bay port to prevent anyone from leaving. As the group waits for the missiles, Straub and the crew member plot to escape the facility through another way. Kate and Julian comfort each other, and then they hear a sudden noise. Straub and the crew member stab Grisham, trying to take the gun back. The crew member gets the gun and begins shooting at everything, hitting Alexei in the shoulder. Grisham is killed by Straub with a fork, and when Julian tries to stop Straub, he shoots Kate in the shoulder. Straub and the crew member attempt to escape from the irrigation system, and Julian follows them. As Straub and the crew member pass through the cornfields, the infection in them starts killing the plants. The crew member finally realizes that they will infect other people, and decides to not join Straub. Straub threatens him with a gun, and when Julian shows up, Straub shoots at him, while the crew member tackles Straub. Straub ends up shooting the crew member and runs away as Julian follows. Julian is able to catch up to Straub, following him through a narrow tunnel. The two end up making it outside, where they see a large alien spaceship hovering just above them. Julian warns Straub not to move, but Straub panics and begins to evaporate in the spaceship's power. Julian experiences a vision of outer space, and finally, he understands what the aliens want. He goes to find Shelley, Alexei, and Kate, and brings them to the rooftop. Julian tells them to breathe slowly and approach the ship. Julian sees two aliens and reveals that the spaceship is here to save them. One by one, they enter into the bright light taking them inside the spaceship. Kate is hesitant, but Julian promises her he will stay by her side. Kate and Julian enter the spaceship. As the spaceship flies away, the research facility is hit by the missiles and destroyed in a nuclear blast. Following the events at the research facility, a news report plays the cover-up story, claiming that an experimental nuclear reactor exploded, killing everyone within the building. While the newscaster lists the names of all the people who died, the spaceship flies off into space, giving the four survivors a new chance at life. The End Thank you for watching. 
Be sure to like our channel and subscribe if you enjoy content like this. Also, let us know what movie you would love us to recap for you.